Addiction is a major problem in the UK. For example, in the first nine months of 2020, deaths from alcohol hit record levels in England and Wales, 5,460, a 16.4% increase on the same period in 2019. In July 2020, a House of Lords report titled Gambling Harm, Time for Action, found that half of adults in the UK gamble at least once a month. A third of a million UK citizens are problem or disordered gamblers. It's estimated that for every problem gambler, six other people are harmed by the breakup of families, crime, losing jobs, losing homes or a death. That's a snapshot of the issue. Behind every number, there is a personal struggle, torment and possibly an individual crisis. In the first of our Mental Health Awareness Week episodes, we're going to be looking at addiction and also looking at how individuals can help themselves. We're joined today by two men who know firsthand what it can be like. First, we have Russell Pierce, a former Welsh boxing champion whose life was taken over by an alcohol addiction. But he now helps recovering alcoholics with charity Kaleidoscope. Hello, Russ. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, a former guest on this podcast, ex cricketer Patrick Foster, who battled for years with a gambling addiction. He is now director of educational programs at Epic Risk Management and is also an ambassador for our charity partners, the Mintridge Foundation. Hello, Patrick. Welcome back Hi, to guys. the podcast. Uh, and of course, my podcasting partner in crime, Will Moulton, is also here for the show today. So before we kind of dive into the heart of the issue uh, and what can be done, I thought we would start off by essentially sharing both of your own individual stories uh, and your own experiences with addiction. So Russ, Russ rather, shall we start with you? Um, yeah. And a, a really promising boxing career, national champion, when, when did the alcohol start to sort of come into your life and then become something that took over your life? Um, so kind of, I, I started boxing when I was sort of six years old, just a bit of a hyperactive child and stuff. Um, and I ended up being pretty good at it. Box, like you said, national level, won a few Welsh titles, British titles and um then kind of sit there just 16 the sort of usual family stuff happens falling out with parents falling out with dad and the the place I kind of I felt comfortable was kind of at the pub so I'd I'd go there sort of yeah finished school at 16 and went to work and I'd go straight to the pub sort of after after work to to not go home and spend time in the family home and then I turned um, professional, I think I was about 18. Um, and it's, it's one of those things you got paid quite good money. Um, and it, just, it was just one of those things that I never kind of, I struggled to always deal with my, my problems, whether it be money problems, family problems, relationship problems. And I think the, the seed was kind of set really from, my younger years where I'd use alcohol to get away from things. Um, and then my kind of career, I think it was about my third fight I, I lost in the professionals um, and I still got paid the same money. And then something in my brain clicked that I don't really have to, don't really have to try to, to get paid quite a bit of money. So my drinking kind of got hold of me then. I'd turn up to fights with no training, not really caring whether I won or lost and it was all to get that payday to carry on drinking um and then obviously you carry on losing carry on not training things that people are going to lose interest and then at the end of it I was just kind of left drinking like bottles of vodka every day and kind of a little dirty flat I was just sleeping on my sofa and yeah, there's bills coming through the door, just ignoring them again. And it, yeah, it just got to a pretty dire place, really, from, from the highs of representing your country and things like that to being stuck in a sort of one bedroom flat on the sofa. It's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a crazy, crazy time, really. 
Yeah. You mentioned there about how <clears throat> boxing sort of you stopped doing doing the boxing for for almost enjoyment reasons and, and you were doing it just to for for the pay packet, I guess. Was there a moment like did you realise early on that this was this was becoming an issue, the fact that you you weren't boxing because you were enjoying it and you were good at it or and, and you were doing it just for the money to to get the alcohol or did that sort of not really register with you at, at the time that was happening? Um yeah so it's, I kind of fell out of love with boxing kind of around 16. Um, but obviously, because I was quite good at it and I was a bit work shy at that age, I thought, oh, this is kind of an easy way to make money. But at, at that time when I was getting paid and I'd go out and just spend all my money on alcohol, going to the pub, paying for friends' drinks, you kind of, it doesn't really matter. I just kind of thought I was a regular lad who likes going out with his mates whereas I didn't really realize I'd be drinking kind of three or four pints to their one um but yeah it didn't register with me for a long time that I needed to sort myself out with kind of drinking and things like that it was um yeah it, it wasn't kind of till I was in that flat on my own and I've got a daughter I wasn't seeing my daughter I'd make excuses not to pick her up from school and yeah, from someone who's, who was always quite proud of his career to throwing it away. Yes, yeah, it's, it's quite hard to look back on now, actually. Now I'm kind of 34 and I'm past it in terms of boxing. But yeah, that's something just I have to deal with. And but yeah, it was it was definitely tough falling out of love with it, really. Definitely. And um, what was it about the the pub more so that that made you feel comfortable? Was it almost that sense of belonging? Um, yeah, it, de- it definitely, from, I think, from the times where I wasn't really going home and didn't really have, I did have, obviously have family, but they didn't really associate with me because of my behaviour. I, I think it was one of those things, like I said, I buy drinks from my friends, or friends, <laughs> who kind of disappeared when things got bad. But um, yeah, it's always I'd always managed to find someone in the pub to kind of, socialize with um whether it be kind of someone my age or someone a lot older it wouldn't really matter to me as long as it had some reason to stay in the pub rather than go home to whatever was keeping me away from being at home yeah it was yeah were there people who who were noticing that that maybe you were, you were drinking more than others or that you were sort of staying out drinking and not going home and did anyone sort of try to intervene or was there just not sort of the the education and the the awareness of the fact that you you might have been struggling? I think um, I speak to kind of my old manager now and he said um, that he knew and towards the end of my career he'd kind of get my wages as I call it from the fight and give me so so much over time um, so I didn't have a big lump sum in my pocket Um, and my ex part like my daughter's mum knew she always tried to get me to seek help and and things like that but I think it's it's one of those I, I didn't really kind of know anything about addiction and things like that when I was that age and I think with me it was it's quite it's, it was hard to see my pattern of drinking as a problem I just thought I was someone who enjoyed going out drinking and and being sociable when when I look back now the way I was drinking I wasn't sociable I was a bit of a bit of an ass most of the time um but yeah I, I never really saw it I, I if, if someone had asked me to get help I wouldn't know where to go for it really and in in terms of that that turning point and I think yeah. it was what a run in with the police and, and shoplifting mm-hmm. that kind of sparked yeah. that um is that when everything kind of fell into place in your own mind that that something was seriously wrong here and it needs to be sorted out y- yeah so I'd when I was in that flat, there was, I was obviously not working, didn't have any money. So I, I'd go to my local shop and um, I'd just take alcohol and just walk out. Um, and I, I did get caught a few times because they're my local shop. They kind of said, if you come back and pay what you took tomorrow, we won't take any further. And that went on a couple of times. And then I, they just um, didn't in the end. They got fed up with it. And <laughs> 
and called the police. And it was when I was, I was kind of sat in a cell and sort of hangover kicking in and you just, I was just fed up with it then. And I'd, I'd kind of had run-ins with the police from being like antisocial behavior and things like that. And, but yeah, I don't know what it was that one time where I got arrested and I'd sort of just had enough and just mentally, mentally, physically just drained and tired from it all. Just never making ends meet. And yeah, I, d- I just had enough of it. You, you say that you ha- you'd had enough, but a previous answer you sort of said you didn't really know where to go or, or what to do to, to get help. So sort of how did you get on that path to to finding the help that you needed um so when i was in the cell in the police station um the, a member of kaleidoscope who i work for now um they they come they used to well we used to in a few years ago come to the people in the cells who were there for alcohol or drug related reasons and ask them if they want help um and i'd been in the cells before and i just no i don't no no i'm fine um but this time I just accepted it and and uh, they gave me a, an appointment and I just, I just went along to it just to see what, what it was all about because I didn't understand what they did, whether someone, I didn't think me telling someone why I'm sad would help me. But yeah, um, yeah, it changed my life really. What, what, what was it about that particular meeting that you had that you went to that j- just seemed to work for you? Um just people listening to me and not judging me I always felt kind of from a sports background everyone knew me as the boxer who was world champion stuff and I always felt quite judged uh, where I'm from from the boxer who kind of could have done lots of things to the the local drunk if if you like but um yeah just the people who'd sit down and listen to me and they don't just yeah, it's it's quite surreal, really. How did it feel speaking about that potentially for the first time? Um, I always describe it as kind of, um, you know, when you need to yawn or catch your breath, and you just finally get that big breath and you can breathe out. That's kind of what it felt like, like the just the, yeah, the weight being taken off, and it's like, oh, right, I can do something now, rather than just all the anxiety and. And things like that building inside, it just felt like it had all been taken away out of my hands and someone else was dealing with it. Is yeah. Yeah, and very much that that release type thing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very strange. Like it, I, I always compare it, it feels like when uh, I really needed a drink, that first sip of drink, and then right, I'm okay now, I've had a drink. And talking about what was going on for me was the same kind of feeling. Uh yeah. Definitely. Um, we'll bring in Patrick now as well. Um, uh, and Patrick's own individual story, because there's probably, I, I suppose, listening to what Russ has said, there's, you can probably identify a couple of similarities with your own story. Um, do you want to just take us through sort of your relationship with with gambling and essentially how it started, but then again, how it became this, this thing that ultimately rules your life for quite a period of time? Yeah, um, unlike quite a lot of people now um, young people possibly gambling wasn't really part of my life at all um, until I was 19 years old Um, my first bet was at university Um, at the time I went to university um, I was uh, contracted by Northamptonshire County Cricket Club I was in the second year of my contract Um, I was able to combine the both Um, I'd had a sort of incredible upbringing I've been very fortunate in kind of education Um, And I got introduced to gambling at university, as a lot of people do, um, as a bit of fun, something that people sort of spend their Saturdays doing. Um, As somebody who was kind of interested in in sport, very competitive, you could say that it was a kind of match made in heaven, but actually it didn't turn out to be that way at all. Um, So I started at university. It started as a bit of fun. um, And uh, I was in a fortunate position. I had a bit more money than most people because I was getting paid to play cricket. I always thought, well, I can do what I want with my money. It's certainly not a problem. Um, And then I went back to Northamptonshire at the end of my first year at university. And unfortunately, my second year of my contract didn't go so well. 
Um, I was gambling at the time, but not to great excess, but it was very much a kind of distraction. And then unfortunately, on the back of a kind of disappointing year, I got released, my contract didn't get renewed. And actually that moment was really difficult. Um, it hit me hard. I always say it was the first time that I'd ever been told I wasn't good enough at something. But actually the worst part of it was my dream was over. All I'd ever wanted was suddenly gone. Um, and I felt like I was to blame for it. Um, and of course, when you have those moments in life, you never really know how you're going to deal with them. Uh, and I found it really difficult, but I didn't want to let on. And actually what I found very quickly was gambling was the only thing that I found or did that provided me with a kind of substitute um, for that feeling of playing. And so I started to do it more. Um, it was also a kind of form of escapism from the fact that I was feeling um, so bad about what had happened. I was so disappointed, but again, didn't really think it was a problem. Um, got through university, was able to get my degree, do all the things that students do. Um, Nobody was aware of, of what was going on or the extent of it. And I then moved into the city. I got a job in insurance. I worked in the city of London in finance and everything that came with that, um, including sort of significant amounts of money, but being around it as well. And I just started to do it more and more um, and became sort of at that point obsessed with it. Um, and then in 2010, I, I had a huge win. Um, I won £35,000 from a football accumulator. And of course, that moment was was life-changing because it changed my relationship with it because at that point, I thought I was invincible. And I thought it doesn't matter, it'll happen again. Um, I never told anybody that it happened. Um, I lost that money in a, in a matter of weeks. And of course, what came with losing that money was A, a desire to have it back, but also a, a feeling of sort of stupidity, um, being very ashamed, embarrassed. Uh, and then when I started to lose, I started to cope in, in other ways. I started to drink a lot. Um, and some of what Russell said there resonated with me um, on that front. And gambling started to take over my life. Um, I made a change at that point about six months later because I knew something had to give. I knew I was getting myself into a, into a mess. Um, and that was mainly because of what it was doing to me financially. I'd never really appreciated the impact it had on me mentally. I always thought about money. And I made a change, drastic change in terms of my career. I went into teaching um, because I thought that would get rid of the problem. And I always thought, you know what, I can stop at any point. But actually, as I found out the hard way, I couldn't um, as much as I wanted to towards the end. Um, when I went into teaching, I, I then found that transition difficult. I didn't have access to the same amounts of money and uh, things sort of started to spiral out of control. It started to affect me emotionally, um, financially, of course, but also professionally because I couldn't do my job properly. Um, and I made decisions at work that I'd regret forever because I started to compromise my position as a teacher by, by borrowing money off people connected to the school, which I'm, I'm not proud of. I knew at some point I'd get found out, but until that point happened, I, I was going to keep doing it. Um, and then a number of years later, having transacted just shy of two million pounds worth of bets online, um, having 23 different bank and payday loans, 76 different online accounts, um, and an awful lot of, of damage um, that came with it, I did get found out. Um, I panicked because I knew that my biggest secret was, was coming out and I couldn't cope with the fact that the world was going to find out about all these things that I was doing, the situation that I was in. I actually saw no way out other than to try and gamble my way out of the problem. Um, and I tried and that failed. Um, and at that point, my world came crashing down because I was left with nothing. And and as Russell just said, I'd, I'd had enough. I was exhausted. Um um, the only way I saw out was actually to do the unthinkable and, and to try and um, kill myself. Uh, and I did um, on a couple of occasions. I came very close. Um, fortunately, before throwing myself in front of a moving train in March 2018, I reached out to my brother. Um, and people always ask me, sort of, why did you reach out? And the only reason I reached out was actually because I felt like I needed to tell somebody Um 
I felt that it was important that someone knew where I'd gone um, for no other reason, because I didn't see a way out. Otherwise, I think I would have done it sooner um, or I would have reached out sooner. But I did it at that moment. Unfortunately, he persuaded me not to do it. And I made the best decision I've ever made in, in not. And at that point, was able to seek the help that I desperately needed. It was the first time in probably 10 years that I'd been honest. Um, I came clean. I told my family and people around me what, what had happened. Um, and as, as Russell alluded to there, the overwhelming sense of relief that I had at that moment was like nothing you can ever describe or put into words despite all the damage that was done. It was the first time I felt good and I felt myself. Um, unfortunately, I was able to then get the support that I needed. I went to through treatment, through rehab and, and managed to kind of piece my life back together, um, try and have a better understanding of why I was doing it, what had driven me to it. Talking and opening up was, was the key for me. Um, and yeah, have been in recovery since and, and life's a lot better without it. Um, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's a story that obviously Alistair and I have heard before, but it doesn't doesn't get any dilute, less diluted that the more you hear it. It's uh, two very sort of incredible stories there to, to listen to. And something, something you mentioned in there, Patrick, and I know sort of Russell mentioned it a bit as well, is about wanting to stop but but not being able to stop uh, i guess that there comes a point where where you do have to stop but how how difficult is that because it's been something that you've you've been unable to do for so long to actually give up the drink or to give up the gambling like how difficult is that sort of physically and, and mentally and emotionally yeah i mean i think in my experience incredibly difficult because if it was just a case of just stopping i think i would have done it um, certainly for a number of years, I didn't want to stop because I kind of loved what I was doing and, and what came with it. And I always assumed that at the point where I needed to or wanted to stop, I just would. But actually, when that point came, I realized I couldn't. Um, and actually, in the latter days, I, I always say to people, it was so strange because I knew I shouldn't be doing the things that I was doing. I, I really didn't want to do it, but I just could not stop myself. Um, and I felt totally helpless. Uh, and, and that was that was really difficult. The addiction had taken so, such a strong hold um, of me. Uh, and it was for me, um, I needed something to happen um, that was kind of really bad in my eyes. Um, and I knew that at some point I would get found out and this secret that I was harboring for so long w was going to be sort of out there. Um, and that moment came and unfortunately that moment came when it was pretty serious because I, I, I didn't know as such, but the r results were fairly inevitable. I was going to lose my house. I was going to lose my job. And, and at the time in my mind, I thought I'd go to prison. Um, and that was as bad as it as it got for me. And and that moment where I didn't want to be here anymore, um, it was tough. Um, but that rock bottom was what I needed to hit. Um, that's not always the case for for everybody, I don't think. But often it takes something for something of significance. Uh, Russell alluded to the fact that he got in trouble with the police. Um, for some people, it's it's a relationship breakdown or or losing something um, that makes you do it. Um, I just wish I'd done something about it sooner, um, but it wasn't that easy. Uh, and if it had been or if it was, I'd like to think I, I would have done. Um, but for me, it was it was those things, really. The moment you reached out to your brother as well, there's always... I mean, that's always stuck with me is when we first heard it because it is such such a pivotal moment and such a key emotional moment as well in the whole story and I suppose it ultimately emphasizes the importance of having someone to to share that turmoil with in Russ's case whether it's someone sp you're speaking to at Kaleidoscope or in your case your brother and then the rest of your family was, was that part of the key as well that once the secret was out that's it it's it's out there and it's sort of not not as much of a weight on your shoulders as it was before 
Yeah, I mean, very much so. Uh, that was obviously the turning point. It was the biggest step for me, the hardest one. But once it was made, everything after that was a lot easier. Um, I think there's a lot of talk at the moment around kind of mental health and addiction. And, and people always say and, and speak about the need for speaking up and telling someone. But actually, sometimes it's not that easy because if it was people would do it sooner and, and more often some people just find it very very difficult and I was that person um, suicide is obviously a very sensitive topic it's a difficult issue and and in that moment it, it didn't feel selfish at all it felt selfless I honestly thought well the world's going to be a better place without me in it um, and my my desire to tell my brother was almost like I need to tell him just so somebody's aware but of course actually when I did that it meant that somebody knew and someone could do something about it um, and I think that was the, the biggest sort of turning point for me was I had nowhere to hide any longer um, because someone was aware uh, and and that's why talking to someone is is kind of so important um, and, and who that is, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, for me, it was my brother and there were various different reasons for that. But yeah, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter who it is, whether it's somebody from an independent organization like Russell or whether it's someone who's as close to you as your brother. It, it's a question of, of just telling somebody. Um, that's, that's the most important thing, I think. And, and people's reaction is so different to what you think it's going to be. Uh, and in my mind, I'd played it over and over again in my head how that moment was going to go and it was very different to to what I ever envisaged and Russ I imagine hearing that there's probably a lot of again similar similarities you can find with Patrick's story with your yeah, own story oh, definitely. too like the, the reaching out and um, speaking to someone which is I wouldn't say it was forced upon me because I was arrested but I always find that find that really difficult I think especially in sport um and boxing in particular where it's kind of not hard man but that, you know it, it's one of those things where people don't want to talk out about it and in my role now kind of helping others it's I'm always kind of front of house when people first come into service with us and I'm usually the first person they meet and it is quite horrible, horrible seeing how worried people are coming in. So I, I always like from being there myself. I always try to make it as friendly as possible. But it is it's so hard because I I find this, with alcohol and gambling really you can take you can take the gambling and the alcohol and the drugs away, but then you're still kind of left with yourself, which is where you need other people around you to help you through that. Um. Yeah, no, but it's, yeah, makes a lot of sense what you're saying, yeah. Do you find from, from your experiences, maybe not your own personal ones, but from people you know, that the, the, the people that are around those who, who are suffering sometimes find it a bit difficult as well because they don't want to say the wrong thing or, or don't want to do the wrong thing? Or is it just sort of a natural, do they just have that natural instinct to just want to protect them and actually it's, it's quite quite an easy thing to, to rally around someone when they've admitted that they're struggling. Yeah, it's it's both. You get you see kind of both ends of it really. You you get family members who who kind of tread on eggshells where um and those who just kind of kick into maybe parental kind of responsibility where they just nurture them and you see all all kinds of different support really. But um yeah, I've I've found with my family, we've we've got a real close relationship now since I kind of admitted it, admitted the things I've done wrong. And it, it is just one of those we have we've had family kind of meetings when I went to rehab. Um I I sort of sent away a survey to them to express how they feel about my views and things like that. And they were really honest with me and how it made them feel. And I find that that really helped me and because I think what when you when you're in the addiction, you are the only kind of person who matters. And you, um, like especially for me, everyone else in the firing line didn't really matter. 
as long as I kind of got through my day and was able to get through it with alcohol or, or whatever is that was the main thing for me and yeah fa- family members just yeah the, I think it's a real struggle for family members we see it a lot um, at work where they'll ring up and ask can we help the family members through it and things and because they don't know what to say and don't know what to do and I think it's really difficult for them. Yeah I would totally agree with that I think one of the the hardest things is that certainly in my experience and, and what I've seen subsequently is is that actually I look back and I wish I'd known the impact of what I was doing um, and going through had on other people. Um, I wish that I knew that my mum, my dad w- w- were struggling to the extent knowing that something was wrong, but that they felt helpless. But I think they didn't want to put that upon me because they didn't want to burden me with that. They were almost trying to protect me. And they thought, well, if we if we let him know that he's only going to find things more difficult or find or feel even more responsibility. Um, So both sides are kind of trying to protect each other a little bit. Um, And and I think one thing that we certainly need to get better at in society is is normalizing conversations around it but I think it's two ways um, I think certainly we need to to be better at talking about our own problems um, and when things aren't going so well and and how we're feeling um, but I also think that the other thing that we need to get better at is, is checking in on each other um, and this kind of culture of actually when somebody does sort of check in with you and and check everything's okay or or ask twice if you like about these things that it's not because it's a personal vendetta but actually they're just worried about you um, and they want to help you but people are very sensitive because they suddenly think as soon as someone says is everything okay that oh well that must mean that I'm portraying x y or z but actually we just need to normalize that happening um, and I think that's where both sides are really important. But it's there's such a fine line. It's such a difficult balance to to get right. Um, and a lot of it is down to the individual as well. Um, but it, it's it's difficult. But the more we can kind of normalize both elements, um, I think the, the more people will have the confidence to reach out one way or the other. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. I'm not. I'm not sure if everyone on this call has seen the Roman Kemp documentary that was for Red Nose Day, the the silent emergency, which was specifically looking at male um, suicide and male mental health. And it, through that, there was a, a group of young guys who who'd lost their friend to suicide, and they'd come out with like the "Are you okay?" twice rule. So, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. No, are you actually okay? And then that's what can often prompt people into opening up. Is that some sort of approach or a similar type of approach that you both adhere to based on your own experiences? Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly, I certainly think it helps. Um, I think those words, I'm fine, um, are, are things that I would say all the time. Um, and usually I'm fine means I'm not. Um, but I think for a long time, people didn't realize that and I think now we've got a better understanding and awareness of that so absolutely I'd encourage people to do it Um, but it's it's as much kind of normalizing conversations around not feeling fine and that actually it's okay to 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 not be okay or, or to be having a bad day or for something to go wrong just as it's okay for things to be brilliant and and life to be treating you as as you want it to so um I think as much as we can do about checking in but also just normalizing those conversations about everything and and particularly dare I say it young men um, about how we're feeling and and in a sporting environment as Russell said it's probably heightened uh, to such a degree I think that's getting better and that kind of stigma is is definitely diminishing but there's still a way to go I think um, whether or not it's intentional well, it's not, but I think um, there's still a way to go with that. You've spoken there about stigmas, and and in preparation for this interview, I was reading uh, a piece that that Russell you've done yourself, and you're mentioning about how 
in certain forms of, of the media or the way that alcohol addiction in particular is portrayed they i think the words were they're portrayed as just always doing bad things and you know you don't see anyone that after they've recovered sort of thing do you think that the way that addictions are portrayed and the way even like the terms that are used to, to talk about addiction do you think that there's still work that needs to be done there to actually make people realize that you know it's not over dramatized and over sensationalized it's just like people sort of go through this and be able to to recognize it and that actually they're not bad people they're just people that are struggling yeah I th- I th- my kind of issue has always sort of been saying um soaps they're always especially drinkers are always seen as kind of park bench drinkers or they're, they're doing certain things or in the papers you'll see someone maybe like gaza at his worst and that's the only side of it you see and you don't they never mention the struggle that's going on in between and uh and i find it with myself as well doing various bits where they'll i look back on the paper stories of myself when i used to get into trouble and they they put in everything that i've done but then that's all people see even with like they don't see what was going on behind the scenes before that happened and then you get comments on Facebook and social media. Um, even recently at work, we've moved into a new building. Um, and the local, some of the local people who live in a town where we're based were putting kind of disgusting stuff on social media about where our building's situated in the centre of town and the kinds of people that would be attending there. And it is, like I went when I went to rehab, I was there with people my age, people in their 50s, 60s, um, ex-lawyers, uh, sports stars, people who've been in music. And it is just one of it can get anyone at any any point. Someone can go through their life drinking socially and then something could happen to them and, and it just takes over them. And you never know what's gone on someone's life. You just need to scratch the surface and just... Yeah, you know, just be more aware of what's going on underneath someone's face, really. Both of you obviously now work for organisations that um, obviously go a long way to helping people who are recovering and have gone through, like Russ says, some, some really tough times that often go on behind closed doors. Um, do you both want to just take us through a little bit about what your own individual organisations do in terms of helping people? But I suppose also maybe some of the common themes you've perhaps seen when, when people come to you asking for help? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the organisation I work for, um, Epic Risk Management, we're, we're very much focused on the education and prevention side of, of things when it comes to gambling addiction. Um, as an organisation, we use lived experience um, it's at the heart of everything that we do and we use that to educate people to try and stop people ever getting to the situation that that we were um we recognize that when it came to to gambling addiction particularly there are a lot of organizations that dealt with people once they were at the edge of the cliff for a better for one of a better phrase um or once they had reached out for help but actually why don't we stop them trying to get there in the first place there will always be people who get there and, and that support and treatment being available is so important. But the more we can do to try and stop people getting there in the first place is, is kind of our mission. Um, and uh, in terms of the work that, that I do, uh, we work in kind of the high risk populations or demographics where the most harm exists or, or people are potentially most vulnerable for various different reasons. Um, and at least then people are entering into a relationship with it being able to make a more kind of informed choice or or have a better understanding of the dangers pitfalls but actually also recognize signs in themselves and other people um when they might need to try and do something about it so that that's kind of um in a nutshell a snapshot of of what we do in terms of kind of the common themes that come out of it Russell spoke really well there about the kind of stigma um, that's attached. And I think one of the issues when it comes to gambling, which is 
my experience is is that actually it's often the way that it's portrayed that well if you've gambled all your money away you're just an idiot um why did you do it but it's not as simple as that and i think that's what stops people reaching out for help is the shame associated with it people think well actually if that's what people's opinion of me is going to be then i don't want to tell people but also it's it's a lack of belief and understanding that there is a way out um the financial damage that comes with a gambling addiction as as i found out firsthand is is horrendous um but it doesn't mean you can't life can't go on it doesn't mean that you can't be happy um and that actually there is always a way out um and i think a lot of people don't ever believe that it's possible to stop or recovery is possible or life is possible without gambling and actually i think that's the most important message is that it is um but what's stopping a lot of people is that they think either i don't want to tell anybody because i'm worried about what people would say or think or the reaction or i just simply don't think it's possible not to but actually as hopefully we're both testament to that that there is always hope and there is always a way out it's not easy i'd never pretend it is but it's worth it yeah um yeah at uh kind of kaleidoscope we so we're basically based in wales i work for the powys sort of region um so we help people with kind of addiction problems whether it's drug or alcohol um and we do sort of harm reduction so we get people on kind of relapse prevention medication whether it's um kind of methadone or various things like that or things to help with alcohol addiction um we work with other services uh kind of like probation the or criminal justice systems with mental health teams um and we work closely with them um because usually more often than not if someone has an addiction problem there is underlying kind of mental health problems um and yeah it's, it's it's really tough for people especially um a lot of people i find don't want to come into service with us because like patrick said it's the shame and the uh you see quite a lot of drug snobbery uh so if someone's a drinker they don't want to come in because heroin addicts come to us sometimes um and it, it is that thing of just picking up the phone everyone's embarrassed about it and since i've been working for kaleidoscope i've had a number of people call me personally rather than the office because they'd rather just discuss it with me than coming into service because they they're worried about their jobs what their employers will think whether family friends will find out um and yeah it's it's quite hard for me knowing what i've gained through stopping drinking to kind of put that on to other people that it's not, it's not bad to talk about it and you you can gain stuff like i I don't struggle now with alcohol, but there's things like I had my wedding um, where I was, I was toasting with uh, sparkling elderflower um, and your, your stag do. We went on a sober stag do, which is yeah quite weird. And it did, but it's it's times like those that I really appreciate kind of my sobriety because we all went on my stag do and we just had a good time in each other's company and. There isn't a distraction of being drunk as there's someone who's causing more trouble than the other, and and that all started through me just accepting the help. All the things I have now, are like from that one kind of bedroom flat, sleeping on the sofa with various bottles on the floor, is all all stemmed from just accepting that help that one time. If other people just, if we can help one person just by them picking up the phone and just accept and the help then it makes our job worth it i think you mentioned there also about about people calling you because um you know they, they felt as though they could trust you and they were maybe a bit too too embarrassed to do it through other ways what how do you help those people to 
to start opening up to to those around them to sort of overcome that embarrassment how does or is it is, it, is that individual for each different person I, th- I think it's it's individual a lot of people find it difficult um i've got quite a dark sense of humor um so my family will just take the mick out of me with drinking so i, I find it really easy with my family um but I think people reach out to me and I, I just kind of tell them there's it's nothing to be worried about and just kind of tell them my story, what I've gained from it, um, kind of why I lost through doing it. Um, and I, I just try to kind of make them feel comfortable that it's not such a bad thing. It's, it's just something that people go through. People go through kind of mental breakdowns, things like that. Addiction is is just another kind of part of part of life that happens to some people. And it's it's nothing to ever be embarrassed about. And I that's why I, I do things like this. I'll speak when people ask me to about it. And I, I actually I see it as a good thing. I I could live now without doing anything that causes me any harm. So yeah, I see it as a good thing for me. Off, off the back of that, and this is kind of for both of you as well, did, as tough as those those um, experiences were, do, do you feel like you've become better people out of it and that it's essentially made you into who you are now? Um, I mean, in my experience, uh, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't wish what happened to me or what I went through on my worst enemy. Um, I really wouldn't. I wish it hadn't happened to me um but actually part of the biggest step for me was accepting it taking ownership of it um and actually once i'd done that i now know that one thing is that i'm much stronger for it um but also i'm a i'm a much better person um everything i was when i was gambling i try not to be now it's simple as that and uh i look back on that time and and realize now what what I was like but I realized that actually whilst I don't make excuses for my behavior that was the what the addiction did to me Um, but I've learned so much from it about me but also about other people um, that yeah it's definitely made me better for it Um, and in many ways I'm I'm kind of grateful for that Uh, and I have to remind myself of that all the time when I start to feel sorry for myself um but yeah, it's it's one of those things because you don't want to say, yeah, I'm better for it. And then people think, well, well, maybe I should go through it because I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. But certainly that's one of the positives I take from it. Uh, and the other thing really is that whilst it, it will always be part of me, I hope it doesn't kind of define me. Um, and one of the big things in life now is is I don't want to be remembered as sort of Patrick Foster, the gambling addict. Um, I'd much rather be remembered for kind of what I do in my recovery um, and and life after gambling. And and hopefully I can do that because I think that's one of the big things is if you let it define you, if you spend your whole life wondering kind of what if and if only, life won't get any better. Yeah, I I agree with that. And I think it's it's definitely, it's made me into a better son better father, better husband, better brother. And they're the main things I, I never was when I was drinking. And as long as I can be those things, that's that's good enough for me, really. Because, yeah, all the all the years I, I wasted being that person, that they just wanted me to be and I wanted to be. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with the way things have gone for me. And it's it's not what a lot of people kind of think. Once you get things sorted, life's just rosy then. But there's there's things. It it's hard work every day, and like this year, for example, I've lost my best friend and my dad in the space of kind of three weeks of each other, and they used to be old excuses for me to go and drink on, but now the it's it helps me because I can be there for my family when they need me, or I can be there for my friends' parents when they need me. 
which I was never that person. I was always a selfish person. Now, I'm just I love helping other people, and yeah, it's it's much better life being, being sober anyway. And I've got because uh, uh, Patrick plays cricket. I remember one time. Oh, so this is nothing to do with anything, but I thought I'd just say. But I once got asked to play a cricket match, and I I kind of said, yeah, this is when I was drinking, and I turned up with um just boxer shorts on and they gave me the cup and I actually hit a ball went to run and this, <laughs> this cup just slid all the way down my leg out the bottom of my trousers and it's left in the middle of the bo- <laughs> the, the pitch and yeah uh, yeah it's very embarrassing I just yeah I just remembered that story then sorry went off on one <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, yeah it's funny times <laughs> We're all all right with some tangents on this show. We've had <laughs> plenty of them in the past, trust me. Yeah. Um, kind of looking at sort of society, I suppose, at the moment, and COVID obviously has ruled our lives somewhat in the last year and a half. And, and people so often go on about the, I suppose, the hidden pandemic behind the actual pandemic, alluding to mental health and sort of what's been happening um, behind the scenes since we've all been locked in our homes for for quite some time is, is that something that you you both see at the moment and is that essentially maybe a crisis if it's fair to call it that once we are out of the covid crisis itself and that's something we have to come to terms with and be prepared to help those people who will probably need it I think from my perspective, there's, there's kind of two parts to this. Um, I think the first is is that I don't think there's any doubt that um, the effects of what's happened is, are, are going to be felt in this way. Um, and I think we may not see the effects for a little bit of time, but I think they're certainly going to be evident. I don't think anybody has not found what we've been through in the last 18 months difficult. Um, whoever they are, whether they've kind of got pre-existing sort of issues or struggles or, or ones that have materialised through it. Uh, and I do think that it needs to be a real focus um, because of that. But I do think that during this time, what's one of the kind of positive outcomes is that I do think people have, have been much more aware of each other's kind of mental health and well-being and how important it is and the focus that needs to be i just hope it's not something that oh well we we were dealing with a global pandemic and therefore we all need to worry or think about and talk about our kind of mental health and well-being during this time we actually need to keep that kind of momentum going um when it comes to to some of the issues that i deal with if you like uh, on a daily basis with, with regards to gambling and um, the convergence between online gaming and gambling, I have huge concerns um, about the impact of, of the pandemic. And, and part of that is through no one's fault, really, in that they weren't able to do a lot of other things, but people had access to that. People were spending more time on their screens online. And what comes with that is more people doing it. Um, and I, and I do think that that became normal and some of these activities became normalized during that time because of the accessibility, the exposure that people had and the ease at which they could do it. And I have huge concerns um, about the next generation with regards to these issues um, on the back of the pandemic. But as I said, I don't think we're going to see the, the effects in reality for for a little bit until after we've come out of it and and I am worried so I think we've got to take the positives from what's come in that there seems to be more awareness and focus on it but also we we need to use that to our advantage in in understanding that there is going to be an awful lot of people um, that have found this very difficult and and that for one of a better phrase there's going to be a serious hangover I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree again. It's especially um, where we are in Paris. It's kind of it's very remote. A lot of our clients are, live remotely, um, and there's no public transport. Obviously, everyone's been not able to travel. 
Um, and there's been there's a lot of loneliness. Um, and we've kind of noticed that our referrals kind of going up as we're coming out of lockdown because people have been in lockdown. They've been drinking more than they probably should have or doing things they probably shouldn't have. Um, and it it is this... It's a, it's a hard one because people are people have been lonely, but it's, it has also been the one of the best times where people do check on each other more now, and I just hope that kind of continues once we get out get out of this, whenever it does end, where people are concerned for each other. Um, but yeah, it's we're I think we're going to see a bit of a spike in referrals. Um, as people go back to work or things start to level out because um yeah it's it's been it's been hard with our clients we've had to work from home all through the pandemic and not having one-to-one kind of face-to-face meetings with people you can ask someone on the phone how you how you're doing how you're feeling and unless you can see them in person you can't tell their body language anyone can say yeah I'm okay but unless you see them you don't know and it's been really difficult to work with people through the pandemic and yeah we're slowly getting back to normal working now and hopefully we can start to start to help people properly and give them the sort of service they they need really. Another thing I've noticed in the pandemic is you're spending more time at home so therefore you're spending more time on your screens a lot a lot of us is because mm. there's not a lot else to do and a lot of then when you're on those screens there are a lot of things that you see f- that you see gambling adverts you'll see mm. adverts for uh, alcohol and you've got so many it's, especially in sports as well you've got so many sponsorships where it's uh, so you've either got like a, a major beer brand sponsoring a massive competition or you've got you know a betting firm supporting football teams do you think that that's something that there needs to be addressed and, and regulated because it, even if, you know, they're not directly putting those things in front of people, they're still being advertised, they're still putting the thought in people's minds. And because we are, we've we got more screen time, we've got more time to sort of take a look and think, oh, that advert looked good. Let's have a look at that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think something needs to be done about it. Um, there's currently a, a review going on with regards to gambling specifically, looking into to things like the regulation and of adverts and sponsorship because I think we've reached saturation point um, now. I don't think anybody would deny that there's too many of these adverts. It's everywhere you look, you can't get away from it. And what I have a fundamental issue with is, is the exposure that young people are getting to it. Um, And that temptation or reminder is, is always there. Um, And that some of them can sort of try to entice people into engaging with the activity. Um, I'm not stupid enough to think that there's not an awful lot of people that that do it as a form of entertainment and for the right reasons and not everybody was in the situation that I'm in but or was in sorry but the more the more people that are doing it the more people that are going to get harmed by it and people if people want to do it they'll do it they don't need the constant reminders um and actually as somebody who has been through it I, f- I find it difficult it doesn't I don't now have the same urges and temptations to go and do it but it but it is a constant reminder um, that I don't need or appreciate especially when it's sort of so relentless in its nature um, but I think that's certainly something that needs to be looked into um, will be and, and hopefully the right kind of changes and, and, and level of changes are made um, otherwise I don't see the problem getting any better yeah and i think um from my point of view when i was drinking the the biggest problem kind of i found was when i go into supermarkets and and things like that the first as soon as you walk through a door of a supermarket there's a big pyramid of kind of lager or whatever on sale or as soon as you go to the the counter in a smaller shop all the alcohol's behind the counter and it just looks at you and stares at you and I think for someone in early recovery it really makes them struggle having to walk past it every time they want to go get a loaf of bread or something um I never really struggled with 
kind of adverts on TV because it, it wasn't physically there in front of me. Um, but yeah, the, the supermarkets and things like that, I always used to find really hard because um, you, you walk past a big crate of beer and especially on days like today where it's really sunny out. And yeah, it's, I, I used to find supermarkets really difficult and the, the way they kind of set things up in there is very kind of alcohol-based. That's a really good point, actually, because I suppose that consumerism, isn't it? it? It kind of takes over a lot of thinking a lot of the time when, like you say, there could be people who who do struggle and you've got that sort of in front of you going in and out, I think is a really good point. Um, and Patrick, you mentioned sort of the the impact it could have on young people as well. D- does there need to be more education at a younger level? Because I suppose at the moment it probably differs from school to school, but whether there needs to have be a renewed emphasis on perhaps giving young people the tools to and the knowledge, I suppose, to to be able to cope with things like that if they do face it in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, education is a is a key to to prevention. There certainly needs to be more of it. There's there's been some real positive changes with regards to gambling, the inclusion in it, um, in kind of PSHE type curriculums and things, and, and more and more schools not ignoring it as an issue um i certainly think that still more can be done um i'd like to see kind of more funding for education with regards to things like this that comes from the government itself um but it's also a a kind of awareness that actually through the accessibility exposure etc that more and more young people are engaging in these activities and we need to try and reach them before they start um i think the other thing that that is huge um and russell mentioned it earlier that that sort of addiction a lot of people see addiction in isolation but actually it is just a, a kind of mental health issue um and the two are kind of obviously intrinsically linked um i think educating young people around mental health and well-being from a young age um and i mean that from a really young age um it doesn't have to be kind of terrifying or or worrying but actually ingraining that in culture is so important um i think previously i certainly look back in at my time although i was very fortunate in my education nobody ever really talked to me about mental health and well-being and yet it's, it's really the most important thing. So it, it has to be prioritised um, in education and, and parents have got a big part to play in that, but but so does the education system, I think, um, because what better tool is there really to equip young people than that? I'm not sure. On that point, some people may say that educating children at a young age about, about serious issues like this can, you know, sort of scare them and can you know, it can be quite difficult, but I guess if you're, you're just talking about just starting to just make them generally aware of things that, you know, issues or even just aware to, to ask people how they are. Is, is that sort of what you're, you're suggesting there, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd never suggest that Russell or I go in and talk to young kids about gambling or, or alcohol, because that could sort of, sort of in- increase curiosity and that sort of thing but I, I think very much as you said this the some of these key messages around kind of vulnerability um what it means to be kind of strong uh the fact that mental health needs to be viewed in the same way that physical health um is why do you when you're young get taught about how it's important to eat things that are healthy because it's important for your physical health and actually we need to start viewing mental health in the same way um, I certainly look back on my experiences and I completely neglected my mental health because I thought, well, I'll only deal with it when something goes wrong with it, but we've all got it. Um, it doesn't need to carry the negative connotations that I think it always has. So, yeah, I think obviously in the right way, just kind of embedding and ingraining these these kind of messages around prioritizing it, looking after it, um, learning about it is massive and and as they sort of get older and and enter into adulthood that's the time to start addressing individual issues like addiction whether it's gambling drugs alcohol um, and other more specific kind of elements of mental health 
And well, I've name dropped the the Roman Kemp documentary once already. Um, but on that note, there was part and uh, a part of that episode where they did go into a primary school who were taking it upon themselves to do that mental health education with their kids. Um, and it's just kind of ranged from, you know, a child just explaining what depression was to them um, and something like that. And I think it can really, really make a big difference um, for, for parents, family, friends, perhaps as well of someone who could be in a difficult position or someone who could be struggling. And we've often talked about how they can be put in a difficult position themselves, not knowing how to tackle it and not knowing how to talk about it. Is there any advice you both would give to someone in that position on how they could approach that very sensitive issue and often a taboo topic in a, in a way that can actually benefit the person who is struggling? Um, if you've got any advice from your own experiences. I think in, in my experience, um, the key is, is addressing it, not thinking, oh, well, this is going to be a difficult conversation to have, therefore I'm not going to have it. Um, I think do something about it. I think act on your instincts because your instinct is is often right. But I also think it's there's a way of going about it. Um, one of the, the things that people fear most is judgment. And actually, if you can talk to people in a way that means that actually, ultimately, all you've ever got is their best interests at heart and that you're just wanting to to kind of help them and make sure they're OK. Um, I think that's that's the most important thing, because people are very fearful of, of being judged. Um, and if you can try and remove that, I think that really helps. I think the other thing is often people think that they need to be a kind of hero and solve the problem completely. Um, and actually, I think sometimes just saying to someone, I don't understand how you're feeling or what you're going through, but what I am going to do is I'm going to listen and be there for you. And that actually it might be that somebody talks to you and you say, well, I'm going to get you some help because there is help available. But I think often sometimes people think, oh, well, I need to deal with this situation here and there. And, and you can say something that actually is detrimental. So don't always think you've, you've got to solve the problem um, because it's not that easy to solve. Um, but actually just be there uh, and listen. Um, and, and if you can, that's, that's as we have both alluded to, sometimes half the battle. If you can just put someone in a position where they feel comfortable to open up, um, you're a long way there. Um, so that would be my advice, really. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say the same thing. Like, um, a few times my family tried to intervene, but it was very much gung-ho. We're going to right, just stop this, kind of telling me about my behaviour, why my behaviour is bad. And all it did was kind of push me the opposite direction. So I didn't want to be told what I was doing was bad. And it is just when I, if they'd have kind of looking back, if you just sit down and you're just inquisitive about how someone's feeling, why they're feeling like that, then it's a lot easier for them to to open up to you than if you push them away. Because the one thing that I, I find a lot is the the addiction is is the thing that's closest to the person. It's the one it's kind of their comfort blanket whilst they're doing it. And if you go in there too quick and just try to take it away from them, then they're obvious they're obviously going to run in, in the opposite direction so it's about doing everything slowly and just yeah just showing people that you care and that's your your main intentions is just to help them and I think that's probably the best the best approach really then sort of my kind of final topic to finish off on and mental health awareness week this. Uh, year is is based around nature and and connecting with nature um how has that helped the the two of you i suppose again we're alluding to the pandemic a little bit here and how helpful it has been certainly from my own perspective anyway in just getting to have that time outside um or back in say the early days of lockdown one when we were allowed that time outside to exercise and how beneficial that was um but yeah in terms of um your own experiences and how 
nature has helped you uh, i'm not sure if there's a way that that you can relate to that or if there's something you've experienced yourself i'll start with russ for that one yeah um so me and uh my wife have always kind of when national trust members which is i i keep down on the down low when i take, tell people i'm a boxer but um yeah we've always enjoyed kind of walking it's always been something we've done um and yeah it's uh, that's the one good thing I think that's come out of this lockdown is seeing how many families, like our local park before lockdown was always dead. And then now you go out and there's families just kicking a ball around, taking dogs for a walk with each other rather than just one parent taking a dog out. Um, and at work, well, yesterday was off. We started a walking group at work um, just so kind of service users can come and meet people who are kind of the same kind of mindset as them we just get out I think a lot of the time if people are in a in a kind of within four walls they close up and they'll only say what they want to say whereas if you get someone out in nature and just walk and talk with them they, they tend to be a lot more open about things and probably say things they don't mean to say and then write it down but yeah so it's it's one of those that it's really good to get people out. And it's just a bit of air in people's lungs, I find, has, has been amazing um, since lockdown anyway, and seeing family members come together. Definitely. Yeah, for me, uh, for me, exercise has, has played a massive part in, in kind of my recovery generally, but also um, as a coping mechanism in the last 18 months during the pandemic. Um I, I sort of developed a, an unhealthy, rela- uh, well, not an unhealthy relationship, but rather a, a, my addictive personality certainly manifests itself now with, with regards to running. Um, and I've become a bit obsessed with it. But actually, it's so good for me, both physically and mentally, and just being outside um, the fresh air. Now I'm a bit fitter than I was. I, I, I enjoy it. Um, but part of it is just being outside um, and people talk a lot about kind of mindfulness and, and finding it in different ways. And it can be quite an intimidating word, I think. But for me, when I'm running, um, my brain operates at kind of 100 miles an hour. And it's the one thing that I do where actually I spend however long I do it and I don't really think about too much. Um, and that for me is massive. It's so nice. Um, but there's something about being outside. Um, and doing it outside obviously it's nicer when the sun's shining and uh, it's warm but even actually during the winter I, I found it really refreshing in different ways so I always encourage people if they can to try and get outside and I know a lot of people love going to the gym and, and doing exercise is so important and I wouldn't discourage them from doing it but actually if you can get outside and amongst nature it's it's kind of even more powerful and effective so um, yeah, it definitely resonates with me. I can definitely resonate with that with myself. Uh, having r- running has has definitely been a little bit of an, a release throughout, particularly the winter months, and just being able to get outside for a little bit. And even we we had a little challenge at work, the, the three mile challenge, where we all got into our teams and see who could run the most miles each week. Got very competitive at times, but. <laughs> <laughs> definitely well worth it um i couldn't let this opportunity pass by without mentioning that patrick is quite literally putting his body on the line and is doing the london marathon um for charity as well so how is that going i suppose that plays a big part in the the running training at the moment too yeah absolutely i mean as you both know um i'm an ambassador for the mintridge foundation and something that i'm really um, passionate about because I love everything that the the charity stands for it's been such a difficult time for everybody but charities in particular and I thought to myself I've had a lifelong ambition to run uh, the London Marathon more so than anything else and no better time to do it really than than now um, and just to write, raise as much money as as I can for for that organization so yeah the training is is very sort of gung-ho um there's not much method in the madness um it's kind of just get up and go um but uh yeah i'm looking forward to it uh, and yeah as i say if i can raise any money then it'll be worth it but um yeah 
if if anyone can support what is an incredible uh, organization i would i'd be incredibly grateful so thank you for mentioning it definitely well, well we agree with that and as everyone who listens to this podcast knows um we've been what well, we've been linked with mintridge for a good long while now um and it feels so long ago when we're actually in the same room together um seeing people face to face my word what on earth was that like um and likewise having done a half marathon myself for mitridge it is well worth it and i know alex is pushing me to do another one so <laughs> that may come might come in the future um thank you both for for sharing and taking part in this episode i think that's an incredibly open conversation um, and I always say it's incredibly brave to open up about things like this because like, like you both said, it is personal. Um, it, it it does look back on sort of darker periods in your life. But like you said, I think the way you've both come out of it is a, is a true inspiration to a lot of people and, and a credit to yourselves. And it also, like you say, put, putting what your experiences back into helping others who are going through a similar thing, I think is hugely admirable. So thank you both for taking part in this particular episode. Um before I round this off, uh, a reminder that Mental Health Awareness Week is hosted by the Mental Health Foundation. So you can go to mentalhealth.org.uk to find out uh, more helpful information if you do need it, um, some helpful advice likewise if you do need it. Um, and as both Patrick and Russ have said, there is lots of help out there. So you can find some information uh, out there. But likewise, the, the two charities we mentioned today, Epic Risk Management and Kaleidoscope also do some fantastic work um, at the same time. So ultimately, spread the word, spread the awareness. As has often been said, talking about it can make a massive difference. So we really do hope this, this has made a, a difference to someone listening um, and in, in continuing to spread that awareness because it is, uh, it is needed. That's it then for this particular episode. Uh, every, take care, everyone. Um, those who are listening, um, better days are ahead, I'm sure. But uh, until our next episode, uh, look after yourselves uh, and goodbye.